Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for welcoming, welcoming me to uh, this panel. Um, my name's Tom. I'm um, one of the uh, directors of Cultivate Oxford, which is um, a community cooperative um, based in Oxford. We've been around for about uh, for almost 10 years now. Um, and over that time, um, Cultivate has had lots of different uh, forms and lots of different business models within it. Um, when Cultivate started, it was growing its own food um, at a farm, which is uh, one of the images you can see here. Um, we also had several different veg vans and food from that farm and other local producers would, um, would, would be in that van and we'd stop at different places around the city as well. Um, we had several different um, pickup points. Um, we would attend farmers markets, lots of different things like that. Um, we, we, like I said, we are a community cooperative. So we have uh, around 400 members. Um, uh, about 200 of them came from a share issue um, about 10 years ago through our, through our legal form of Community Benefit Society. And um, over the years, we, we've gathered um, sort of annual members of around 200 on, a, uh, on an annual basis as well. Um, we don't exclusively sell to customers though. We are a community cooperative. And so we sell to both uh, members and, and sort of the general public as well. Um, the, thing I, the reason I wanted to just give you a brief bit of context is that um, I think one of the interesting things about Cultivate is the most permanent feature of it is probably its impermanence. So we don't actually, we don't do the farm anymore. We had to drop that for financial reasons. Similarly, vans have broken down over time and we've not been able to replace them. And the model that we've got today is very, very different from how it started up um, uh, in, uh, in 2012. Um, where we're at today um, I, is, um, yeah, like I say, very, very different. Our model today um, still involves um, going to a farmer's market. So we tend to farmer's market um, once a week in Summertown, if you, if you know Oxford, um, uh, through which we make sales to um, you know, retail customers and our members. Um, uh, that is the, the food that we sell is almost exclusively from, from producers in and around the county. So um, we've got about 30 suppliers throughout the year. Um, the bigger thing though that we do and that has been really enabled by Open Food Network is to expand our sort of retail veg box offering. Um, we, before COVID, we uh, were doing around 25 customers a week. Um, it was a very sort of um, early stage uh, sort of business really idea. Um, and within about three weeks, we were doing 250 customers a week. So uh, a sort of tenfold increase. This The, the image I've got here is um, one of, um, uh, we, we, we had lots of people come to us and um, uh, give, a, you know, give us resources and their time and, and all these sorts of things. This is actually a, a barn in a farm just on the edge of Oxford that um, one of our directors had access to. So um, we filled that barn with uh, lots of different boxes and had to sort of totally reorganize our systems. People were flocking to us to sort of volunteer and help out as they were sort of furloughed and also were working, looking for work as well. Um, we've, we've since sort of, um, whilst we went up to 250, we actually dropped down to 150 a week and we're now leveling out at about 200, uh, 200 boxes a week again. But um, uh, one of the strange things about COVID has been actually this uh, strange expansion. It was nice to hear from, I think it was Kate uh, in the last talk who said they had a sort of threefold increase. Um, so sorry to trump you on that, Kate. Our tenfold increase was was challenging, but we've, we've done it. Um, uh, anyway, I'm gonna. Uh, I know this talk is about sort of poverty and, um, and food poverty, and how hubs are responding to them. Um, just want to tell you a quick story. So uh, I've not always li lived in Oxford, but um, uh, I moved here about four years ago, um, and um, uh, like many places um, in the UK, there are um, areas of poverty. Um, Oxford can be thought of as a sort of fairly affluent area, but there are. There are places um, in and around Oxford that do experience some very extreme poverty. And um, when my partner and I were looking for houses in Oxford, um, we started to filter by the price we could afford. And um, the estate agents ended, ended uh, up taking us to the three areas you can see here, uh, Barton, Rose Hill and Blackbird Lees. Um, I actually ended up buying a house in Barton because it's the only place I could afford. But also um, these are the three main areas in Oxford that, where there are very high levels of, of uh, poverty, food poverty included, but um, uh, all the other forms of poverty that um, everybody will be familiar with. Um, so yeah, like I say, you can see me in that sort of 
top uh, top hand uh, top right hand circle, and that's where I am right now. Um, uh, Joe earlier also spoke a little bit about um, some of the uh, some of the sort of uh, poverty stats in uh, Oxford as well. And um, uh, yeah, um, there are several thousand people in Oxford who are experiencing food poverty every every day. And I'm going to come on to some of the ways that I think we're trying to um, help address these. Um, I just want to say one thing about our model as well. So. Um, uh, I sometimes I think about cultivate as a, a social enterprise. We're a cooperative, and which is a form of social enterprise. And I've noticed over the years that um, there are often I, I probably put three different categories of ways in which um, social enterprises make their social difference. I think the first way is um, you know you can generate loads of revenue and loads of uh, loads of financial surplus, and then donate that money to a to a, a cause that you think uh, is worthwhile. I think the second way is to um, uh, make sure that the product that you're doing, the product that you're making, um, causes that causes that social good to take place. So a really good example of that is um, uh, fair trade products. So you know, when you buy a fair trade product, you're ensuring that the social good occurs. Um, and I think the third way is usually around the sort of existence of that social enterprise. So um, a good example of that is, um, you know, say the, the community owned village shop, um, because of its existence, it stops, you know, Mrs. Norris going lonely um, uh, when she, she goes and buys her shopping there once a month. I'd say that um, the reason I raise those three things is because I want to say that I think the way that um, Cultivate goes around um, making its difference in food poverty is not necessarily through direct projects or that sort of thing. It's more embedded into the work that we do. And I think you probably see it through those last two forms. So we build it into um, our overall business model, as well as, um, you know, hopefully our very existence being a, a point of difference for uh, people experiencing food poverty. Um, nice. Um, so I just got three quick examples um, of some things I think we're doing um, around food poverty here. Um, I'm going to start off with the more boring ones and about governance, and then they will get sexier, I promise. But um, uh, the um, uh, one of the things we've been so I've mentioned we're a cooperative, and one of the things that we've um, sort of uh, been exploring re recently is how we can build um, cooperativism into um, several different bits of our work um, and um, cooperativism can happen both at a, a membership level as well as um, a board level as well as an operational level as well and um, certainly at a board level we've been trying to practice sociocracy which um, I won't go into it now but it's a way of sort of um, doing shared decision making amongst the, share, the stakeholders who are involved in that decision um, and similarly we've been bringing in sociocratic um, uh, principles to um, the operational team as well. Um, and the way that sort of ex expressed itself recently is that we've recently um, adopted an the Oxford living wage for everybody who um, uh, who works for Cultivate Oxford. And we've got a fairly large team now, especially due to the COVID um, response. But um, we um, we had to take on volunteers initially because we couldn't work quickly enough when when uh, when the increase in veg boxes was happening. But we've converted several of those volunteers into paid staff who um, have either uh, been out of work because their jobs have gone or, um, you know, um, need need top ups to their income because because they're reducing the, the number of hours that they work. Um, uh, and so I'm really pleased that um, several we call um, our packers and our, and our uh, market staff grocers and all of our grocers are now earning an Oxford living wage. The reason I think that's important is because we think it's really, really crucial that um, uh, people have can have dignity in sort of being able to purchase the sort of food products they have through the salary that they earn. Um, the Oxford living wage is £10.21 an hour, which I think is significantly higher than uh, what uh, the, the national living wage, I, I don't know what it is, but um, uh, it's expensive to live in Oxford and we're really pleased that we're helping our team members and us and our staff to be able to afford the things that they, uh, they need to be able to live. Um, amazing. Um, Second way we and uh, second way we go about tackling food poverty is through working with um, lots of um, local partners. Um, 
Uh, Joe earlier mentioned Oxford Mutual Aid. Joe, if you're still about, do you just want to briefly just tell everybody what Oxford Mutual Aid is? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Oxford Mutual Aid uh, was uh, set up at the um, start of the uh, first lockdown uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic because it became clear that there was an increase in uh, food poverty through people losing their jobs being on furlough or falling through the gap. So the purpose of Oxford Mutual Aid is to make sure that um, anyone who requests it has a meal every week and, um, well, ha gets given a food parcel each week. And um, unlike food banks, you can uh, sign up for as many food parcels as you need. And it has a lot of volunteers, including me. I volunteer a couple of hours a week for them. Um, yeah yeah thanks joe i think that's does it does it a really good description um we um so as part of our weekly market we we try our best to um predict uh, how much food we're going to sell at the weekly market um but we often have have leftovers which are still great and fresh uh, and decent food um but um uh we think it's important that that food from the producers in the county goes to uh, people who who need it most and each Sunday after the market Oxford Mutual Aid come and collect a fairly decent portion of that food and use it to provide um, uh, often uh, reheatable meals for um, several hundred people locally um, in and around um, some of those areas that I mentioned earlier in Oxford. Um, I was at uh, one of the one of the um, centres that um, uh, one of the one of the kitchen centres that um, uses or cultivates food is um, called Donington Doorstep. And when I dropped it off at Donington Doorstep, um, the, our, our surplus food about a month ago, there was two volunteers in there, um, Alex um, and and a, a colleague of his, and they they were midway through making about 170 uh, reheatable meals for. Um, uh, lots of people locally. So again, I'm really pleased that the food that um, uh, that we get, you know, that's being produced in Oxford is going to some of the uh, people who um, really need it most um, in and around the city. Um, the final thing um, I just want to come to is just around um, uh, our food producers as well. I mentioned we've got around 30 food producers that we um, procure from throughout the year. Um, we don't procure from them consistently throughout the year because of seasonality but um we um one of the things that i didn't say in the sort of oxford context is that um uh, whilst we operate in the city we also have um a lot of um impact on the sort of um the rural areas of the county of oxfordshire and most of our food producers are based in the county um several of them are trying to make a living from good food production and um, a few of the ones you can see on here are either, um, I wouldn't say exclusively, we're not exclusively buying from, but Blackland Organics, for instance, you can see at the bottom there is um, uh, we are, uh, we, we, we almost exclusively take all of Jamie's um, food produce and we pretty much ensure his living, um, which uh, is really, really pleasing. So again, just coming back to that message of embedding, um, embedding our our food poverty um, sort of uh, resilience um, into our practice. Um, we make sure that we are buying from people who want to make a living from good food production and ensure that they can get the food that they need as well. Um, excellent. The final bit, this is just a very, uh, This is, I, I just want to take advantage of the fact that um, there's several people on this call and, and to uh, take an opinion. Um, several years ago, I was involved with a piece of work that um, came, that, uh, uses Alexandra Rose uh, vouchers. These are vouchers that are very similar for, to, um, you know, there's sort of national food vouchers, but you can actually use them um, at market stalls as well. And I've been exploring recently um, uh, whether or not Cultivate could bring Alexandra Rose vouchers um, to Oxford. Um, the reason I wanted to ask a question about this, because I'm always a bit hesitant about food vouchers, you know, I, I feel and I'm sure this has been picked up from the presentation that, um, you know, that um, the best way to give people dignity and the best pay way to um, uh, ensure people can get the stuff they need is actually to pay them a decent wage and pay them a decent livelihood. Um, 
Uh, and I think food vouchers are probably a, a cause of, you know, some very fat cat salaries at the, at the high end of organizations for getting to resource um, workers um, and, and, you know, compensate workers for, for their for their hard work at lower end of the organization. Um, so I guess my question is, is, you know, do 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 we think that food vouchers should or could be adopted into the food hub sort of systems that um, you know, uh, Cultivate and several of the other speakers um, have, um, have sort of uh, spoken about as well, the impact that we're making. I don't know whether it should be a piece of practice that we do or not, essentially. Um, so yeah, maybe we can discuss that later, but um, that, that's all I've really got to say, um, apart from that, you know, I think that, um, you know, it was really inspiring hearing everybody else talk and, um, you know, food poverty, it's, um, it's part of one of the, um, one of the many forms of poverty that many people experience. The estate that I live on, just to bring it back to here, you know, it's um, about 80% council um, owned, um, and uh, I'm one of the few sort of, sort of private owners here, but, um, one of, the, one of my favorite things over the last year has been getting to know my quite elderly neighbor um, who um, has only lived in Barton all her life. Um, and when we moved in, had never even tasted a courgette. Um, I'm really pleased to say that partly thanks to being a neighbor and partly having to be, you know, from having been involved with Cultivate Oxford, um, Lynn, uh, our neighbor last year, grew her very own courgette plant and tasted it. She did spit it out immediately, but I'm really pleased that we actually were able to get her to taste uh, her first ever sort of uh, healthy fruit and veg. So, um, yeah, uh, that's all I've got to say. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening. I'm open for questions. <laughs>